Welcome, family and friends. Thank you for accepting God's invitation for us to worship Him together today. My name is Dewan, and I will be your live stream host for today. Welcome to those of you who are on the Discord, and welcome to those of you who are on the live stream chat or the YouTube chat. Um, it's so great to be with you today. Um, so this week is our last week of our Churchianity series. But next week, we'll be starting our Christmas series called The Light of the World. And today we want to recognize that today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a time of hope as we reflect on the birth of Christ, on the coming of our risen Christ, and on the ongoing coming of the presence of Jesus by the Holy Spirit to rule in our hearts here and now. So when we take time to just be in the real presence of God, we enter into the fullness of Advent. So I also want to encourage you to take note of our special service times for Christmas Eve and for New Year's Eve so we can continue to do this together as we move through this season. So as we think of the gift of Christ's love, I also want to encourage you to continue to think of ways that we can reflect his love and worship him with our financial contributions. These contributions help to support the ministry that's happening in our community and as we approach our year end, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your continued generosity. Okay, so before we engage in musical worship, another symbol, as you see here, another symbol of worship during Lent, um, during the Advent, sorry, during Advent time, is that we light candles in expectation of Christ's coming. So the Advent candles that we have here, there's five candles, and the four corner candles represent the four Sundays of Advent. And then the center candle represents Christ. So the four candles represent hope, peace, joy, and love. And each Sunday, each of these candles will be lit until we come to our Christmas Eve service. So let's light. Today is hope. So let's light the first candle. Got this going. There we go. There we go. So, if you're following along in our Being Christ Advent devotional, um, today there is a verse in there, Matthew 1, verse 23, and it says, Behold, the virgin shall bear a child and be with son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to see that you are with us. Nothing that comes into our lives is too difficult or messy for you. Bring us the same hope that came that first Christmas, wrapped in swaddling clothes, sleeping in a manger. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this immeasurable gift of Jesus. Amen. Let's head off to musical worship. Well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. It's good to be together. We're glad we could all make it in this somewhat treacherous con conditions of this morning. <laughs> um, we're just going to take a few minutes to uh, focus our attention on the Lord and remind ourselves of what's important. And we just invite you to stand and sing with us and um, just, yeah, we'll worship God together.
Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. year it's really easy for me to place importance where it doesn't belong so this morning I was thinking of Philippians 3 starting at verse 7 to help us with this I once thought that these things were valuable but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done yes everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord
I started to think about talking about faith, there are so many like catchphrases about faith that were quickly coming to mind. Things like faith as small as a mustard seed, faith that moves mountains. We just need to keep the faith. We want to choose faith over fear. And you can keep going, I think, for a long time. Things that are stitched on pillows, things that are hung on walls. And some of them are helpful. Some of them are good pictures for us to hold on to. Some of the phrases that we know that would kind of come to our minds around faith are not helpful, are not true uh, to the faith that we want to talk about. And with something so ubiquitous as faith, so everywhere, this word that we talk about in so many different directions, it's bound to be true that there's some pieces, some connections in our minds with faith that are good and some that are not. And we can start with one that I would argue is slightly less helpful than helpful. And this is this phrase of inviting Jesus into our heart. It's not a phrase that we would use in Kid Max in the meeting house uh, anymore. And that's for a couple of reasons. And then I started looking at where did this even come from? Because for sure, when I was growing up, this was a phrase that was used in church, uh, in like vacation Bible school in these different contexts, this invitation to invite Jesus into our heart. And it's not that it's so bad, um, but it just is a funny history of how we got here. So I was reading a bit about it. I was talking about how In church history, back to the 17th and 18th century, there were preachers that were using this phrase of Christ coming into our heart, Christ coming into our heart. And it became just a popular kind of turn of phrase. And then as we move into the 19th century, a lot more emphasis started being placed on a personal decision to follow Jesus, what I choose. And so this language of me making a choice to have Jesus in my heart as part of my life. And it really is in children's ministry, um, in ministry to kids that we come up with this phrase of inviting Jesus into our heart as an adult way of trying to explain something that was happening. But interestingly, I can tell you as a parent, as a kid's pastor, that it's not that helpful for kids because it's a metaphor, like it's an image. And that's actually very hard for children to grab onto because we're not literally talking about Jesus moving into our heart. Um, it's difficult for kids to understand. So that would be an example of some language around faith that is not necessarily super helpful, despite its best intentions. And another thing around it that we can question or we can start to think about is this idea of faith being a one-time decision. Because that's also the way that we talk about it a lot of times. Have you made a decision to follow Jesus as if it's a one snapshot thing and then that's all that matters? Meredith Miller is a pastor and a Christian writer, and she questions this idea of limiting faith to a one-time decision when we're talking about it. And she draws this parallel. She starts to question it by also looking at the concept and this picture that we have used a lot of times in church explanations about faith being like a wall. And so we've talked about faith as a firm foundation and faith being this wall. So we start with a firm foundation of faith and then we learn more and more about who God is and we build this wall of faith, one brick, one brick. As our knowledge grows, as our faith grows, we end up with a wall. And Meredith Miller is saying that this is problematic potentially because the way that a wall works then is that if we take out one of those bricks, if there's one piece of our faith that is called into question for whatever reason, there's a hole in the wall. (laughs) And if you do that a couple of times, all of a sudden the wall can fall down. The wall can fall down. And so she suggests in a book that she has written recently, and the book is talking about ways that parents can talk to their kids about faith, and it's beautiful, but I think it's so good for us as adults too. She suggests in the book that maybe instead of thinking about faith as a wall, as a linear, as a built structure that stacks on top, what if instead we think about faith as a web? as a web. And so she's talking about, we have instead this idea of something that is woven. It's still created. It's still growing. It's also still anchored. It has to be holding on to something to be there, but it's this web of connections, these strands of different ideas and beliefs. And there's a flexibility to a web. There's a pliability to it. And that one different than a brick, 
one strand can be called into question, can be removed, and it doesn't undo the integrity of the web in the same way that it undoes the integrity of the wall. And so it's all metaphoric language again. And in both cases, whether we're talking about a web or a wall, it really matters what's the grounding, anchoring thing behind this principle that we're talking about. And so in either analogy, in either picture word, it's Jesus that matters the most as the foundation, as the anchor, as the grounding. This is the thing that matters the most. And we're going to come back to that again as the most important piece. But it also matters how we talk about faith, how we picture it in our minds, the way that we teach about it to kids, the way that we talk about it as adults that are learning together. It matters how we picture it and what our understanding of faith is because it's how we engage with our belief. It's how we engage with Jesus. Oh, let me read this for you. This is a quote from Meredith Miller about that. So I don't skip it because her words are good. In a web, the things we know are like strands, all interconnected rather than being built on top of one another. There are still anchor points that hold the web in place. Oh, I said all of this. I quoted her directly. The structure is flexible, pliable, able to endure stress and even certain amounts of breakage while still surviving. Very good. So with these things in mind, how we picture faith, where it's anchored, what we want to take away about what faith is, let's take a look at Mark chapter 5. We're going to dig in to the story of the bleeding woman. So into the Gospel of Mark in chapter 5 and this story, you will find it beginning at verse 25. And so we're going to read it together in just a second, but I just want to point out that this story is actually sandwiched in the middle of another story. So it's in the middle of the story about Jairus and his trying to seek healing, trying to seek help for his daughter. And in the beginning, this is just sandwiched right in the middle of that story, which I already just kind of love about it because it's like a treasure that's there and you could just you could just miss it if you're reading for kind of the main plot line of the other story you could skim right over this and miss the richness that is here as we're talking about faith so let's not do that we're going to read it together let's start reading at verse 25 a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding she had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe, for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. So this woman has been bleeding for 12 years of an unknown cause. Different people guess at what this is, hemorrhaging or some other condition, but we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Of an unknown cause. And so if you are a woman and know anything about bleeding, we can imagine the pain, the discomfort, the weakness that she has been experiencing with constant bleeding of a severe nature. And in addition to all of those physical difficulties that she would have been experiencing. Jewish law also states that she would have been unclean because she's bleeding constantly. According to Levitical law, she is unclean. She cannot be touched. She cannot be present in the company of others. She cannot participate in worship. She cannot go into the places of religion. She is an outcast in every way 
in her culture and in her society because of this condition. So this is a physical condition, but much more than that, this is a psychological condition that she will be facing. It is a social exclusion that she will be facing. It is emotional trauma and difficulty that she will be facing. In every way, she is in a state of wretchedness. She is outcast from society. And we also get a little insight when it's talking about the doctors that she would have seen, the doctors that she, she had money, she had means to get help from these doctors, but it gives the indication in scripture that she probably was taken advantage of. And whether that was intentional or not, the doctors that she's going to were giving her things to try, right? They weren't just saying, we don't know how to help you, sorry. They were giving her things to try. And so in one way or another, she's riding this roller coaster of hope hope for a cure, of hope for an answer, feeling hope, going to someone new, and then instead of getting better, she is getting worse. She is getting worse over and over again. And so she has reached this point of just utter desperation. She is at the end of herself in every way. She is aware of her deep need. And this is the place where she also says in verse 27, she had heard about Jesus. She had heard about Jesus. In this place of desperation, in this place of deep need, she makes the connection to the things that she has heard about Jesus. And so despite everything that she has experienced at the hand of doctors, at the hand of her um, social context, all these things, she risks it again to try to get close to Jesus. She takes the risk of hope of getting her hopes up that something could be different. She takes the risk of shame and scorn by going into this crowded public place. And then she sneaks up behind Jesus, essentially, and touches his robe, touches his clothing, believing that there would be power in his clothing. And I love this little tidbit too, because what I was reading here is also that there was kind of this superstition, kind of this like known social belief that if you could just touch the hem of the garment of an important person, of someone who is perceived to have power, that that would have an influence on you. So she's coming to Jesus with this kind of fascinating mix of some kind of hope and belief in what she's heard about who Jesus is, but also this superstition that's just coming from her cultural experience. And she comes with both of those parts. It's messy. It's just real. She doesn't have it all figured out. She's in a state of not really knowing, but she comes with what she does have into the presence of Jesus. And she is healed. She's healed. There's also this combination in her, I feel, of courage and boldness to move into this space where she is not welcome, where she is not meant to be. But then there's also in her person and in her demeanor, a fear and an uncertainty because she comes from behind, right? She's bold to enter into the space, but she's also sneaking. She doesn't want Jesus to see her and she's just trying to touch it from behind. And so again, this duality, this space for the fullness of what she is experiencing courage and fear together, boldness and uncertainty all at once. And I love the picture that this begins to paint for us of how we can look at faith, of how we can look at faith, because there's room. (laughs) There's room for us to be as we really are in this kind of faith. And isn't that good news? (laughs) It's room for places where we can say yes to the things that we do know for sure, the things that we're hoping for and the things that we're longing for, but there's also space for places that are not yet figured out, that don't yet make sense, even where we have it wrong, even where we have it wrong. There's room for that in this kind of faith that comes to Jesus and that leads to healing. This is the web, right? This is the flexibility. This is the many strands that are anchored, but also that create room for growth, that create room for regrowth, (laughs) that creates space for both certainty and questions. It creates space for both being and also becoming. So let's get back to our bleeding woman. She touches Jesus' robe, his hem, and she is healed. And Jesus knows, he knows right away, and he pauses, turning around to see who has touched him. And so as a result of her belief, of her faith in this moment, there becomes this relational connection between her and Jesus. When she touches his hem and she's immediately healed, she knows immediately that she's been healed. Who knows how? Jesus knows immediately that she's been healed. So they now have this relational connection in this moment 
where they both know Jesus responds to her faith. He honors her faith and she is healed. And in her touch, her choice to move to Jesus brings her faith and the person of Jesus together in that moment. So they're both active in this, right? She's choosing to come to him. Jesus brings the fullness of who he is. And in their relational connection together, this results in her salvation. This results in her healing. This results in everything that she needs in that moment as her faith meets Jesus in real time. Another really significant piece for me as we read this story is to notice that at the beginning of the story, throughout the story, the woman is unnamed. She's unnamed. She's just called the bleeding woman. And this again is in contrast to the story that it's sandwiched around where Jairus, we have his name, right? He is a man. He is a person of position. He is a person of significance. He is known. He is honored. He sought out Jesus and Jesus is going with him. And this woman is no one. She has no identity. She has no name. But in the moment of healing that happens, in her moment of faith, in her moment of relational connection with Jesus, she is healed and she is also named by Jesus. And what does he call her? Daughter. He calls her daughter. This is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus calls a woman daughter. And so this is not only a name for her, this is a full, complete identity for her. She is now blood with Jesus. She is in his family. She is his. She is known. She is named. She is redeemed. She is welcomed with grace and healing. And she is in the family of God. This woman who has not belonged for her life, right? For these 12 years that she has not belonged to anyone, Jesus says, you are mine. You are seen. You are mine because of your faith because of coming to me. Jesus calls her daughter and he says, go in peace, go in peace. And so I was reading about this too. And it was saying that this is a very, the phraseology is a very common Jewish goodbye. Go in peace. Just like the way, not a greeting, but the opposite, right? Like when you go in peace, a common Jewish phrase when you're saying goodbye, but even more than what we would think of about going in peace, like, yes, it's a freedom from anxiety and worry, but even more than that, it is a blessing of wholeness, a blessing of completeness, this term, go in peace. And so this is what Jesus is saying to her. You are my daughter. And now as you go from here, go being made whole, having everything you need. You are in right relationship with God. You're good. You're good. Go in peace your suffering is over. This is the aftermath of her faith. Her faith plus Jesus is life, is peace, is everything that she needs. It's everything that she needs. So what do we learn from this story for our faith? What is faith? What do we see here? What sort of faith do we want to embrace? Do we want to live into in order to be more Christ-like Christians and not simply Christians who have a churchy lingo? I think we see in this story that faith is a certain hope. And so like we talked about before, I don't think that faith is certainty. <laughs> I don't think that faith is certainty. Having faith doesn't mean that everything is known for sure, that we don't have questions anymore, that we don't have fear anymore, that we don't have doubt anymore. I don't think that's faith. And I think in the places where we have painted that as faith, mm -hmm. we have caused problems, right? Because then we're trying to build it like a wall that says you need to know these things for sure. And if you don't, uh-oh, it's knocked down and there's no more faith. But I don't think this is the faith that looks like Jesus. I don't think it's the faith that Jesus honors in this woman. There's room in faith for questions. So we don't have to have everything perfectly figured out. We see that she comes with some kind of wonky superstition mixed into her belief about what's going to happen. But Jesus doesn't seem to mind. In that moment, he honors what he sees in her heart, what he knows of her soul. He honors her coming close to him with her questions, with the things that she does know. So there's not certainty in faith, but faith is certain hope, certain hope, a hope that is sure. It's not wishful thinking, right? 
It's not hoping for something for Christmas. This is a hope that is sure because it's grounded in the person of Jesus. A hope that is certain that the promises of God, that the person of Jesus can be known beyond a shadow of a doubt. There is no uncertainty when we're talking about who Jesus is. And so this faith is a certain hope. I think we also see that faith is a choice to trust, a choice to trust. There's a risk. We see it lived out in this woman's story. And I think we probably feel it in our own lives in a variety of ways. There's a risk. There's a vulnerability to trust that God is who he says he is and to trust that we are who God says we are. We, ch we choose to trust. We choose to believe. We choose to say yes to the things that God has put before us. And mixed into that trust is all of those things that we can't know for sure. But the hope is sound. The anchor of God's character and his love hold fast. And there's room for the other mysteries mixed in. This choice to trust allows for that weaving of a web that we're talking about. We choose to say yes, and it allows those strands to be anchored in a way that creates the room for the other things that we need to question then, for the other things that we need to work through. And when we trust in the character of God, when we trust in the things that we know for sure about who Jesus is, it allows some of those other questions uh, to be held with less severity then. Because we do know some things for sure. We do choose to trust and it allows that flexibility. It allows the possibility of other things being undone because this choice to trust in God will not be, will not be. And faith is a relationship with Jesus. So we see this, we saw this as we're reading through that story. This is the woman and Jesus together. It matters who our faith is in. It matters who our faith is in more than anything else, more than anything else. It matters what our faith is in, who our faith is in, because we can have faith in a lot of things, right? We can have faith in a lot of things, but it's not the faith that's creating the solidity. It's the person of Jesus. And we have seen this. We've lived this, I'm sure, in all of our lives. Sometimes we've put our faith in people, We've put our faith in leaders. We've put our faith in outcomes, in a specific outcome that we're praying for, that we're hoping for, that we're believing for. We've put our faith in plans, in things that, you know, are, that we think are good. And why wouldn't we hope for that? Why wouldn't we long for that? We've put our faith in those things coming to be. And all of those places, all of those places where we put our faith will surely fall down will surely fall down. It is not the place where we want to put our faith. But when our faith is in the person of Jesus, it is the kind of hope and trust and love that brings healing, that brings wholeness, that brings everything that we are longing for, that brings everything that we need. And so it matters where our faith is. It matters where we're believing there is certain hope, where we're putting our trust, where we're investing in relational knowing of God. It matters where our faith is. I brought this box. It's really old. And I was looking at it today and I think it's actually growing stuff on the outside, but that's not the point of the story. <laughs> this is a box of letters that belonged to my mom. And I know I've shared some pieces of my story and my family's story at different points. I have uh, a fairly ridiculous uh, heritage of cancer that runs through my family. And my mom died of colon cancer when I was seven. And this is a box that belonged to her uh, that's full of letters. And some of them are just letters with friends, like back when people wrote letters <laughs> on pen and paper, cards and letters to friends that she received and different things. But also in this box are quite a few cards and letters that were written to her and to my dad when she was sick, when she got sick with cancer. Lots of people that were writing letters, writing their prayers, writing their hopes, writing. And there's many letters and cards in here that say things like, I'm absolutely sure that God will heal you. I've been praying for you and I'm absolutely sure that you will be well. 
that this will pass, that this will be better. My faith is strong and just believe and you will be well. And so as you can imagine, it's a bit brutal. (laughs) It's a bit brutal to read them. And my sister and I have sat with them and there's lots that's lovely about it. And some of them are where my mom writes back. And, but it's hard to sit with those prayers, right? To sit with those letters that say, I believe, I have faith, I know that you will be well. But through different uh, times of processing about all the things that have happened in this particular piece of our story, my heart has settled at a place where I actually believe those prayers have been answered. Not in the way that those people thought they would, not in the way that we would have hoped for, but those prayers for healing, for wholeness, for life, for saving, they have been answered. They have been answered for her, just not in the way that we necessarily would have chosen. But I do have absolute confidence that she has been healed, that she is with Jesus, that she is restored, that she is whole, that she is experiencing abundant life with God. I believe, in fact, that Jesus looked at her and looks at her and says, daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And the reason that my heart has been able to settle there is because of my own faith. In addition to a legacy of cancer, I also have a legacy of strong faith in the person of Jesus that I'm so thankful for. And I have chosen to put my certain hope in who Jesus is, that he will not disappoint, that he is with us and for us. I have chosen to trust that God is who he says he is and that we are who he says we are. And so there is nothing to fear. I have chosen to say yes to a relationship with Jesus. And I can assure you that my faith is far from perfect far from perfect, but it does move me closer to Jesus. It does move me closer to Jesus. And when my choice to come close to him meets with the fullness of who Jesus is, there is life. There is life. There is wholeness. There is freedom. There is deep purpose. There is everything that we need. So how is our faith? How is our faith? How do we live into and speak out about our faith in a way that draws our souls and also draws other people closer to the real heart of who Jesus is? How does it feel to reconsider the image of our faith as a web instead of a wall? How does it feel to move into a space where our faith looks and feels like Jesus? Not a faith that guarantees outcomes, not a faith that has no space for fear, has no space for questions. But a faith that says yes to communion with God and to the resulting gift of abundant life with him. It's a good faith. (laughs) It's a good faith. It's all that we need because of who Jesus is. Why don't you take a deep breath (laughs) and we will and I will too. And we're going to just take a minute to sit and receive, sit and reflect, sit and let settle the things that God is speaking. You can close your eyes if you like, take a couple of deep breaths. And if you're comfortable, I'd invite you to just place your hand across your chest. It's good for us to remember when we're taking in a lot of words, a lot of listening, that we are embodied, that we are present, that the things that we're learning are for the whole of who we are. And I'm gonna just read a prayer for us, a prayer of response. This is written by Ted Lauder, a prayer that gives room as we continue to listen to what God is saying. A 
eternal God, lead me now out of the familiar settling of my doubts and fears. Beyond my pride and my need to be secure, into a strange and graceful ease with my true proportions and with yours. That in boundless silence, I may grow. Strong enough to endure and flexible enough to share your grace, your grace. Amen. May it be so, Lord. May it be so. Amen. Faith is a certain hope, a choice to trust, and a relationship with Jesus. Thank you so much for your teaching, Laura. Thank you so much. So where are you investing relationally? relationally? I just want to encourage you to connect with your home church. And if you don't have a home church, go to themeetinghouse.com slash, I think it's fine dash home church. You'll see um, the link below or in the, in the notes. Um, so definitely connect with the home church. And also, I want to also encourage you to check out our service times for Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and New Year's Eve for our online services. And finally, another way that we can connect as community is that this Saturday, this Saturday, December the 9th, we will be having our annual general meeting. So if you're in the Oakville area, you can come in person or it'll be streamed online. And we have a lot to share and process together this year at our annual general meeting. We'll be sharing plans of our way forward, including news from our network development team, leadership plans, electing a transitional board of directors, and providing some important financial updates. So these are all ways that we can continue together to journey as a community in Christ and looking forward to seeing with you and connecting with you in those places. So accept this blessing of wholeness and completeness from God our Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Go in peace.